Okay, so everybody know you're being recorded, or at least Tessa is. Um, Tessa Halls is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and outdoors woman who focuses on women's stories and her writing has appeared in Washington Post and Atlas Obscura's Kick-Ass Women series. She's a frequent public lecturer and performer and has appeared at the Seattle Art Museum, Washington Ensemble Theater, Annex Theater, and other locations. This is our second talk by Tessa. After the phenomenal She Traveled Solo, Strong Women in the Early 20th Century, which is on YouTube if you want to catch it, or on Channel 370 uh, this week. Uh, today, Tessa will share her work focusing on her forthcoming graphic novel, Feeding Ghosts, beginning with the story of her journalist grandmother, who worked in Shanghai during the communist takeover. Feeding Ghosts tells the entwined narrative of three generations of strong women against a backdrop of Chinese history and diaspora. Delving into the themes of mental illness, intergenerational trauma, loss of culture, and mixed race identity, Feeding Ghost traverses a century of Chinese history to explore the complicated ways that mothers and daughters both damage and save one another. Halls comes to us live from Port Townsend, correct? I actually just moved back to Seattle recently. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. And uh, you're, thank you for taking this time to give this uh, lecture before your next adventure. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you take over and uh, you said that people can interrupt with questions if they have them? Yeah, yeah, at any point, just just jump in. Um, I'm gonna screen share because I'll be showing visuals. So f I guess find some way to get my attention probably via audio because I won't be able to see the chat. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Take it away. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the invitation to come present again. Um, the last time when I presented uh, as part of the Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau, I think the, the post-talk Q&A um, we had was probably my favorite because we just ended up talking about librarians and libraries and how, you know, how so much information is not digitized. Um, and it was just a love letter to, I don't know, to receptacles of knowledge and, and things that are, are still analog and hard copy. And I just really loved it. So it's fun to be able to be back here presenting again. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of, oh, where did that go? Sorry, I closed the window I needed open. Give me one second. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do as an artist, just to give you some context before um, I start showing you pages from my graphic novel. So I talk about being an artist slash writer slash adventurer. And what I love to do more than anything in the world is to go to really remote, inaccessible places. And that's really what inspires me. So this is a picture that I took when I was working down um, at the McMurdo Research Station in Antarctica. So what you're looking at here is actually um, a frozen ocean. So what looks like mountains in the background, those are actually islands. Um, and back when I first started out as an artist, what I did was pretty straightforward. I was a painter, I showed in galleries. It wasn't complicated explaining what I did. Um, these are some images from a show that I did called In the Eye of the Storm. And most of the pieces in that show were actually paper cuts. So I generally like to work without a safety net and I would paint something for you know, 60, 80 hours and then just take an X-Acto knife to it. Um, and this is a video, which I think I can make play, just so you can see kind of the scale and the level of detail. So there's my hand for scale um, of how intricate these pieces were. So I definitely don't shy away from doing really kind of um, painfully, painfully detailed work. So these are just a couple more paintings to give you a sense of, of what I did before I started becoming like a, a multidisciplinary weirdo. Um, so, as my career progressed, I found myself thinking less in terms of working in one specific media and being more interested in, in what are the guiding questions. So the three questions that really drive what I do are, how are we connected to our histories? What does it mean to be a strong woman? And how do we find our way home? And the image in the background here is from a three-story mural that I did for Microsoft. And because of the site, I had to do it on panels. So it was like painting on a pre-cut jigsaw puzzle and I would never be able to see the whole thing at once. Um, and so kind of as I got further into my career, I started really feeling the sense of accountability of how do I use 
my voice and my hands in some way that can be of service to the world that we live in. And so these are images from a project that I did right after Trump's election, um, when the first anti-Muslim bans were being passed and there was a lot of xenophobia and anger being directed towards immigrants. So I partnered with the Asian Counseling and Referral Service, which is an organization here in Seattle. And I worked with Club Bamboo, which is their senior social club, um, and basically just hung out there for a couple of days, going to their activities, working with translators to interview some of their residents um, who were first generation Americans about their process of coming to the US and what home meant to them, just to kind of try and, you know, get these, these different stories to counteract all of these really awful narratives that were being pushed around about, you know, how and why people were coming to the US. This is another project that I did with an organization called Break Bread, Break Borders, and they're based out of Texas. And what they do is they gather together refugee women who cook and they share foods from their homelands and they host these big community dinners and they use the ticket sales from those to fund their cooking program. And so um, I got hired to turn their migration narratives into comic books and then illustrate their favorite recipes which all sounded really delicious. I wish that this could have been an in-person project so I could eat all of their food. Um, the other thing that I do, which Alan mentioned, uh, I give illustrated lectures that kind of blend uh, historical narrative, archival photos, and sort of looking at broad strokes of social history, sometimes through unexpected lenses. So this first talk that I give on top is women, trans, and femme riders in early cycling history, which looks at how the bicycle has always been used as a tool for social activism and how its innovative technology allowed for women and people of color to have autonomy of movement for the first time in the 1890s. And then the other talk that I give, which I gave um, for, for your residents is She Traveled Solo, Strong Women in the Early 20th Century. Um, so this is from the first talk, kind of what I do is I look at one timeline, which here is the evolution of bicycle technology, but then intersperse it against what was happening in terms of um, racial and civil rights to sort of see how these entwined power structures were occupying the same space. Um, I love researching. I love doing deep dives to find the material that I present. So this is a comic um, titled The Awful Effects of Velocipeding, showing how people were worried that the instant a woman got on a bike, she was no longer going to play nice with social mores and would just become a terror. So, you know, you have this like proper Victorian woman showing her legs and chain smoking. Just love this. Um, and then as a visual artist, I'll often take these talks and then compress that information into a visual project. So this was a magazine asked me to try and, and take that one hour lecture and compress the bulk of the information onto one piece of paper, which was a fun logistical challenge. Um, the other talk that I, I gave um, for your residents was looking at how an evolution in communications technology really changed the ability for women to hear one another's stories and kind of created a, a cohort of mentors and role models. And so I look at a series of seven women who were born during this period of technological innovation. Um, just a couple to share because they're so much fun. This is Ada Blackjack, and she's a Native Alaskan woman who is known as the female Robinson Crusoe after she survived on an expedition north of Siberia where all the men died. And then this is Bessie Coleman, who was the first woman of Black and Native American heritage to get a pilot's license in the United States. So um, shifting gears a little bit, the other thing that I do and, and kind of I think became most known for in the internet, which is funny because it's a bit of a departure from sort of the history of what I've, I've done before, is um, two summers ago during the uprisings for racial justice when Seattle's Capitol Hill turned into an autonomous zone, I went in um, basically trying to give some some contextualized nuanced information as to what was actually happening because there was just so much disinformation on the ground. And so at that point, everyone was still working from home and a local arts nonprofit said that I could sleep on the floor of their conference room um, so that I could be right near the, the barricades and have access to this neighborhood. And I meant to stay for maybe three days but then it became so clear that there was such a need for information that I ended up actually staying for about three and a half weeks until the final police clearing at the end. And so I essentially just set up a, 
a one woman comics journalism media room and tried to to provide information because people were were really wanting to know what was happening from somebody who was there. So along the way, um, found myself in a really interesting role of being seen as a breaking news comics journalist covering topics of social justice. Um, and I definitely found that my sweet spot um, as a writer and an artist is, is definitely not reporting on current events. I like to be able to, to kind of let the dust settle and see, um, sort of see the broad strokes of what has happened when there's a little bit more time to think and reflect rather than trying to put things out in real time. But um, along the way in the aftermath of this, I ended up with a much larger social media following than I, I kind of ever anticipated. And so I felt a sense of obligation to use that platform to still try to continue to give educational information. So for a year, every month, I would do a deep dive into some topic having to do with um, social justice or racial history and would, um, would make a comic on that, that topic. So now I'm gonna kind of shift gears to talk about um, the main thrust of what I've been doing um, kind of for the last seven years. So these are pictures from a show of paintings that I did at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. And for that show, um, initially the curators wanted me to just show in progress pages of my book. But when I went down to meet with the curatorial team, they mentioned to me that um, Santa Cruz used to have this whole series of Chinatowns and that all of them had been destroyed, some of them in some pretty horrific ways, um, you know, burned down, um, like a, a lot of racist history was involved in this. And so um, I kind of heard that and was like, wait, 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 I think that's what this show should be about. It should be about uncovering this really buried and unknown um, Chinese American history that's been erased from the infrastructure of this town. So I ended up making this series of six paintings kind of going into these stories. And what I did is I turned the gallery into a continuous timeline, um, starting in the 1500s, looking at the history of Chinese migration and the first establishment of these Chinatowns so that for each painting, the viewers could look and see the history and primary documents um, that had informed what I ended up making. And so just to give you an example, this painting on the right is called Picking Up Gold. And this is about how um, in Chinese culture, when somebody dies, it was traditional to bury their body. And then um, about a decade later, these people called bone pickers would exhume the body and very carefully and delicately use chopsticks to remove every bone and put them inside of a box to be shipped back to China so that they could be laid to rest in that person's ancestral village. Um, Obviously, when, when Chinese migrants would come to the US, sometimes that became impossible, especially during some of the periods of Chinese history where um, you, you couldn't ship bones back to mainland China. But one of the things I want you to, to notice in this photograph is that the piece of wood in the top corner of this image is a Chinese grave marker. And the museum had it in its collection because it had been preserved um, because a white family had stolen the headstone and, and built it into a tree house. So that was one of the things that I did in the show um, was really went through the collections and, and tried to give a reader, the viewer, a really immersive history um, of, of these lost Chinatowns. So this is just a pan back image showing you again how um, the whole gallery became a timeline and you can see some more of the museum's collections, these pottery shards and stools in the right hand corner. And so once the story got to 1927, that's the year that my grandmother was born in Suzhou, China. Um, and that's also the year that the Chinese Civil War began. So as the timeline bled into my own family's history, then I started bringing in the book that I'm working on, which is about this history. So by the end of this exhibit, um, that is when I finally did show in progress pages from this graphic novel and bled into this family story that I've been working on now for, for seven years. And I had jokingly told the curators, well, we should just build a replica of my studio so that everyone can look at all my research materials and see my drafts and, and kind of make that part of it transparent. And um, they actually did it. So that is a, what's in the corner there is it's a replica of my my workspace. Um, 
And that brings us to what I'm going to focus on for the bulk of this talk, which is my forthcoming graphic novel, Feeding Ghosts. Um, the question that people always ask is, what is your book about? And my short answer is complicated mothers. <laughs> um, the longer answer. Okay, here we go. So this is my grandmother, Sanyi, and she was born in 1927. And she was kind of an unusual um, woman because my great grandparents made the choice to educate their daughters. And for that era in China, that was really, really not common. Um, boys were considered much more valuable because essentially women were seen as you know expensive liabilities because once they were married they would just join their husband's household and the the family who raised them wouldn't reap any of the benefits um so women were generally not educated in that era so my grandmother um very independently moved to shanghai and she moved there in 1948 so the year before the communist takeover and she found work as a journalist so during this really tumultuous period of Chinese history, she ended up having an affair with a Swiss diplomat and ended up a single mother raising a mixed race bastard child. So um, my unknown Swiss grandfather went back to Switzerland. Um, he basically, once he found out my grandmother was pregnant, she never saw him again. So my mother never met her father, but she was growing up with a mixed race face um, in an era where anything that was not seen as being traditionally Chinese was very dangerous. So also my grandmother had been writing for pro-nationalist newspapers. So once the communists came to power, she was labeled a rightist, so essentially a political dissident. And she was arrested and held for days. She was put through harassment and thought reform campaigns. Um, and that went on for eight years until she was eventually able to smuggle herself and my mother, who was um, seven years old at the time, uh, she smuggled them to Hong Kong in the false bottom of a fishing boat. So they left as refugees. Um, once they got there, my grandmother immediately wrote a memoir called Eight Years in Red Shanghai. And it basically told the story starting with the communist takeover and leaving with their escape to Hong Kong. And because at this point, the communist government was really controlling the flow of all information out of mainland China, people were just absolutely starved for narratives from behind what was then called the bamboo curtain. So the book became an overnight sensation in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, it probably goes without saying that it was very much a banned book in China. Um, it was not safe to have a copy. So no one on the mainland was able to read it, but because so many refugees had fled um, the communist takeover, there were just, there were a huge number of people who wanted news of what had been going on in the mainland during this time. So once this book came out, my grandmother was able to use the money from that to put my mom into a very elite boarding school in Hong Kong. And that is where my mother learned to speak English. But at that point, my grandmother had been struggling with mental illness. And basically the moment my mother was safe, she had a psychotic breakdown and was institutionalized in Hong Kong's first psychiatric hospital. And she never really recovered. So at that point, my mom had been in this elite boarding school for one year and the money from the book had run out. So they took her on as a charity case. And my mom was essentially raised as an orphan by this colonial boarding school. So eventually my mom got a scholarship to come to the US. So she came over in 1970 and brought my grandmother over in 1977. Um, so I grew up with my grandma living in my nuclear family, um, but my mom did not teach me Chinese. So I was never really able to communicate with her. And I have a complicated relationship with my mother. Um, this book has really done a lot to help heal and, and make that relationship closer. But um, I basically left home at the first moment that I could. And this book is my attempt to be a prodigal daughter and, and really find a way to come back. So like I said, I've been working on this for <laughs> seven years. And um, I began in 2015, and my first step in this process was reaching out to my mom because I knew that I couldn't do this without her. So for the past seven years, um, my mom and I traveled to China together. I met my Chinese family for the first time. This is a picture of, of me and my mom and my great aunt. Um, this is my grandmother's sister. My grandmother passed away in 2012. And so essentially, for the better part of a decade now, I have just been 
trying to educate myself about my own ignorance as to a lot of the history um, of what my family went through and, and tell this story. So what I'm gonna do for you now is I'm gonna go ahead and show you the prologue of my in progress book. Um, and then depending on how much time we have, I'll, I'll show you a couple more sections from it. Oh, and one rule that I have for myself, I have these, um, these paintbrush dinosaurs. I wish I had one to show you right now, but because this, this book is so heavy and the content of it is so dark, I've made a rule for myself that the number of appearances by my paintbrush dinosaurs which kind of denote that we're in the studio and I'm narrating from the present, um, that my dinosaurs have to outnumber the times that I draw my crying mother. Um, and that has actually been a, a really challenging ratio to maintain. So it's, it's a heavy book. <laughs> so I'll just jump into the prologue. Um, and where I'm at now, this is the, the table of contents. So the book is very close to finished. I'm in the final few months. Um, and, and should have my life back by late summer. Um, but you can see here, that uh, yeah, it's close. The structure's all there. <laughs> all right. All water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Prologue. Water has a perfect memory on a night train between Shanghai and Guangzhou, 2016. On a night train in China, 2016. If you had told me five years ago that my mother and I would find ourselves here, traveling back into the past, in the hopes of building a bridge between us, the sheer impossibility would have caught in my throat like a bone. My relationship with my mother has been largely defined by my absence, a lifetime spent in running away. But I am searching for the thread that first began this legacy of distance, hoping it might show me how to come home. We are barreling through the dark somewhere between Shanghai and Guangzhou, Retracing the journey my mother and her mother took 60 years earlier when they fled China as refugees. What do you remember from when you left? It was so long ago. I had just turned seven. I remember my mom, if anything, she was excited. Things had gotten so bad. I remember her telling me, we are getting out. It's sad, really. She thought that she was saving us, that she was saving me. But she couldn't outrun her mental illness. It was waiting to devour us. She always was a drowning woman, trying desperately to throw me on the shore so I would not drown with her. My art studio, the present. Maybe I should back up and explain how we got here. My name is Tessa Holes. My name is also Hu Renxing. I grew up in a house choked by ghosts, and my grandmother's son Yi lay at the heart of a darkness always felt but never named. My family shaped itself around the contours of this quietly devouring negative space. My grandma lived with us, but as a child, I knew only three facts about her. One, she was from China. Two, she had once been a famous author who wrote a best selling memoir. Three, Long ago, something happened to her that caused her to lose her mind. My mom didn't teach me Chinese, so between the language barrier and my grandma's mental state, I was never able to know her as a person, only as the broken fragment of a culture I did not understand. I didn't know how to reconcile the story of my grandma's past with the 90 pound specter who shuffled around our house in gray Costco sweatpants. In 2018, when I learned enough Chinese, I sat in a closet-sized Shanghai Airbnb and did a search for Sun Yi's book in its original language. I learned there were 25 copies in libraries all over the world. So the family myth was true. She really had been a famous author until her life effectively ended in her early 30s when she lost her mind and never found it again. That illness would go on to shape two more generations with its pain. My mom was still a child when Sun Yi's mind collapsed and permanently inverted their roles of mother and daughter. They made their journey from China to Hong Kong to the United States as a fused world of two. By the time I was born in Northern California in 1984, my grandmother had been living within her own madness for decades. Sun Yi was the one who lost her mind, but the two of them bore the damage together 
and I could see the wounds more clearly in my mom. It was as though Arundhati Roy wrote, something had reached into her throat, plucked her voice out, shook it down, and returned it without its laughing edges. The light could not touch her skin, and I grew up with a mother who contained an unpredictable ghost twin whose actions contradicted the words and expressions she wore on her face. She was simultaneously shelter from the storm and the maelstrom to be feared. I did not understand the physics of the ghost twin. What summoned it? What banished it? Where did my mother go when it seized her face and voice? Sometimes it took the form of coldness when emotion was expected. At others, the most innocuous topic would prove to be a mine. Emotion was either chillingly absent or a raging tsunami that saw my drowning is the only valid demonstration of my love. As a child, I lacked the broader context to unlock the ghost twin's most vital fact. It was traveling through time. Trauma researcher Dr. Vessel van der Kolk writes that being traumatized means continuing to organize your life as if the trauma were still going on, unchanged and immutable. Once I began to see the ghost twin as the coping mechanism of a terrified, uncomprehending child trying to save her mother from the black hole of her collapsing mind, I understood I was witnessing what van der Kolk describes as the dual reality of a relatively secure and predictable present that lives side by side with a ruinous ever-present past. Sun Yi's body escaped China, but her mind did not. Her adult life was spent as little more than a shell to hold her ghosts. My mother learned to grow a life around her darkness, but her ghost seethed and nestled rage in the chasms ripped through her core. We survived trauma by denying we have been damaged and neither my mother nor my grandmother were able to see the ghosts that swarmed them. Is this what it means to be the daughter of immigrants, the first generation far enough from the pain to be able to see how deeply it is there? Because I was a writer and an artist, because I saw ghosts, my mother was terrified I'd inherited her mother's disease. Even now it hurts to contemplate the magnitude of her fear. I knew nothing about the specifics of Sun Yi's collapse, only that it occurred while my mom was still a child and that my mother then spent the rest of her life caring for her mom. My mom never knew a reality in which she was not a caretaker for someone broken. For over 50 years, they existed as a fused world of two. Sun Yi could not hold her own reality together. She relied on my mom for that. So I do not blame my mother for extrapolating that love therefore meant exercising complete control over someone else's life. She dedicated herself to saving her family from all potential assailants, even if those assailants were of her own invention. My mom believed that my grandmother's mental illness was created, connected to her creative temperament and the fact that she had been a writer. So when it was clear from day one that I, my mother's only daughter, was both a writer and an artist, she was terrified I had inherited her mother's disease. I was a perceptive child, keenly attuned to the invisible weight that pulled at the marrow of my family's bones. My mom took this sensitivity as a sign that I contained the latent seeds of her mother's insanity. She wove my childhood into a cocoon of protective fear, and I struggled to stay afloat in a vast ocean of untold stories that only I could see. I wanna make this clear. I was enormously loved. Of this, there has never been a moment of doubt. But what do you do if trauma distorts love into something cloying and fraught? Unresolved ghosts just go stronger across generations, destroying children with the very things their parents swore to save them from. I know she was trying to protect me, that the actions she took were mirroring the only model of love she had ever known. She only knew how to love something if it was broken. So to love me, I had to be broken. To be broken, she had to break me. She could only save me from my mental illness if I was first mentally ill. From childhood, I was raised to believe my mind was a trap waiting to be sprung. We needed to tear me open, find the flaw in me before it could wake up and attack. And so I grew up fighting desperately for the custody of my own mind. Across generations, my mother and I learned the same childhood lesson of withdrawal. 
burying our softness behind sharp edge walls as we snarled warnings with cold teeth. In response to the ways our childhoods failed to protect us, we idealized our deepest cultural myths from a place of wounded necessity. My mom doubled down on Chinese filial piety, venerating a system in which family was everything to somehow undo the fact that she had never had one. And I retreated into the feral romance of the Wild West, where space, silence, and independence were limitlessly vast. Undeterred by being born into both the wrong gender and the wrong century, I became a cowboy in my mind. I adopted a coat of arms that held only two absolutes. Horse theft is a hanging crime and nothing owns you save your hunger for the frontier. I built a suit of armor from an apocryphal wilderness seeking a freedom that only comes from severing all ties. To quote Wallace Stegner, the Lone Ranger has no dwelling place except in the saddle. And I honed myself to a knife edge of independence that would cut anything that came near me. My mother took the opposite extreme. Isolated from all ties in a culture where family was everything, she idolized filial piety with a near pathological devotion. It was as though she believed she could reach back through time and through sheer force of will, give herself to family she never had. My mom and I had no Rosetta Stone to translate between these fundamentally incompatible languages, these contradictory notions of what made us feel safe. Lacking the ability to find any common ground, we each saw the other as the emotionally unpredictable assailant. From within our mutual anger, neither of us could see the larger form of our conflict, where our real fight was over the moral validity of the cultural systems that had shaped us. A cowboy and a good Chinese daughter dueling over the right to leave. I ran away from my family's darkness at the first moment I could, putting a literal world of distance between myself and my ghosts. I spent my 20s in the wilderness, shaping myself around a solitary freedom as extreme as the entrapment I'd fled. Home became everywhere except where I was from. I hiked on frozen oceans in Antarctica, biked alone across deserts in Ghana, lay on my back in the Alaskan tundra as I watched the Northern Lights. I learned to need no one, to leave and leave and leave and leave and leave and leave. But then in 2012, at the apex of my distance from my family, Sunyi died. Like a tree dropping its leaves in winter, Sunyi's death revealed hidden branches. In the clarity of her passing, I saw I had misunderstood the scale of my ghosts. Their story was so much larger than just one clamped life. I'd thrown myself into the furthest frontiers I could find in an attempt to break free of my family's darkness. But as my mother and I shifted our orbits to accommodate Sunny's absence, I began to understand that our deepest bonds often belong to the things we most vehemently sever ourselves from. I had unwittingly inscribed a perfect negative of the very cage I had sworn to escape, and its bars were no weaker for their inversion. As I neared the end of my 20s, the life I'd built began to seem less like freedom and more like running away. In Chinese culture, there is a concept of hungry ghosts, where the spirits of people who did not finish what they needed to do on Earth are doomed to eternally roam the planet with an insatiable appetite trying to quell a starvation that has no end. As a child, I felt those ghosts in my bones and tried to outrun their howling. Sonny's death forced me to confront the reality that true freedom wasn't something I could find on some distant frontier. I would have to face my ghosts. I fled this epiphany for as long as I could and instead doubled down on a life defined by velocity and momentum. But I had lost faith in the threadbare lie of my cowboy and could feel my family's ghosts aching for the use of my voice. This story was stalking me. And I knew for all that I denied my own fear, I was not telling it because I was afraid. In 2015, a few months past my 30th birthday, I found myself alone on my bicycle atop a mountain in Mexico and knew it was time to stop running. And so I began the most ambitious adventure of my life and set out on an expedition into my family's past. 
The book you hold in your hands is a record of this near decade long journey, and it tells my story the only way it can be told. As part of an entwined trinity where my mom, my grandma, and I blur together against the backdrop of Chinese history and diaspora. I began with an intimate question. What broke my family? But that Fred led me to see how shatterings happen as fractals across time, how my grandma's fractured mind was the map of a fractured country, and how all of our cracked hearts sprung from the same seam of historic rupture. Wherever possible, I have used the text of my grandmother's memoir to allow her to speak in her own words, and I have worked closely with my mother to record her story. Our narratives often disagree. All history is contested. But what is a family if not a shared story? And what is a fissure if not a place where truths diverge? These pages are the most accurate map I have been able to draw of the landscape of my family's breaking. And I will do my best to serve as your guide as I bring you into this wilderness. Maybe now you have a better sense of the borders my mom and I have already crossed to arrive in this train car. This chamber of suspended animation where we exist outside of time and context as we hold a small but hopeful spark against the darkness of our past. Sometimes I think back on the last leg of the trip when we were on the boat to Hong Kong. In a way, the journey never fully ended. For my entire life, I have always heard the echoes of those waters calling after me and my mom. So let's begin at the beginning in China. So that's the end of the prologue. And um, from there, you know, basically the book jumps back in chronological order, beginning when my grandma was born in 1927 and eventually working back up to the present. Um, I'm just looking at the clock. I think we have a, yeah, I think we've got a little bit more time. So I'll just show you a couple more sections from uh, other parts of the book. Um, so this is this is a section um, kind of showing how cultural misunderstanding between me and my mom. Um, it really wasn't until we started looking at some of our contract content, um, conflict through the lens of our cultures that I think we started to really understand some of the reasons why things between us had been so strange. So this is a sequence about um, my grandmother later in life and and her writing. My grandma's mental state was measured by one simple rubric. Was she writing? When she was in relatively stable periods, she was content to sit all day at her writing desk, endlessly scrawling out the same stories of her past, recording them over and over and over again, even as they made progressively less sense. Sun Yi was a vain woman who thrived on recognition. She needed to believe her words were still being read. My mother's strategy to accommodate this is a perfect illustration of why we were at war. I came home one day to find my grandmother agitated and yelling at my dad while waving a piece of paper. Ah, yeah, they steal my money. Very bad, very bad. That piece of paper was a fake publishing contract. My mother created an imaginary publisher in New York. Fake name, fake address, fake letters sent through the real mail fake contracts accompanied by fake checks, all to create the illusion that someone was reading Sun Yi's incoherent words and turning them into books. She went so far as to have them printed and bound so Sun Yi could receive printed copies of her books. That day with a fake contract. Look, Sun Yi, you have been paid. No one is cheating you. You are okay. Tessa will come help you. I took the paper in my hand and repeated the family lie. See, Sunny, it says right here, no one took your money, you are safe. But inside me, everything was screaming, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You're taking some of the mental illness that makes her paranoid that people are lying to her and shaping her reality, and you're lying to her and shaping her reality. It's a deception born from great love. I didn't disagree. I also didn't think that love made it right. But I was the only one who held no right to criticize. I was the one who left. So which is the true story? Did the selfish American turn her back on her family? 
Or did the principled lone wolf take the only moral stand she could? The only distinction between a cradle and a cage is whether or not the occupant is trying to break free. Over a decade later, I heard a podcast that began to reframe the way in which I saw this story. A Chinese grandmother is diagnosed with cancer and the family protects her by keeping this knowledge from her. But the extended family has to gather to say goodbye. So they rush the timeline on a family wedding as the cover and the entire family gathers in China to say farewell to the one person in the family who does not know that she is dying. The Americanized granddaughter is the only one who feels torn apart by the choice to lie. I felt my chest constrict in recognition. My mother wasn't crazy. My mother was Chinese. Where I saw deception, manipulation, and overreach, she saw love, devotion, and duty. How can one bridge a gulf so vast? I'm American. I'm Chinese. The fake books were just another chapter in the ongoing story of the fight my mother and I have been having for my entire life. Um, so I think, I think there's probably time for one more section. I'll show you just a couple more pages. Um, this is this is a section that goes into some of the history that I'm teaching. So along the way of telling um, the stories of my mom and grandma, the inflection points in their narratives line up with all of these really tumultuous periods in Chinese history. So I'm, I'm basically giving a crash course on about a century of, um, of Chinese history through this book. In 1958, Mao announced the campaign to eliminate four pests, flies, mosquitoes, rodents, and sparrows. The entire country was conscripted for the effort. Even school kids did their part bringing severed rat tails to school as evidence of their patriotism. Their contributions were tallied and posted on public leaderboards. But it was the sparrows that really got me. In the technique for their slaughter, I saw Sang Yi. Mao took an oblique approach. Rather than killing the birds directly, he mobilized the masses. The loyal patriots were turned out with pots and pans, banging them every time the sparrows tried to land. For days, the terrified birds were kept on wing until they finally dropped dead from sheer exhaustion. In the end, they were destroyed by their own fear. It was during these frenzied, anxious months of flight that my grandmother both wrote her memoir and began to lose her mind. So I think that's probably a good stopping point for a Q and A. Is uh, Alan? Does that seem good, or do you want me to do a little bit more before we switch? What do you think? I don't know. Depends on the crowd. We do have um, time. Do you guys want a little more? Do you have some questions? I think maybe a tiny bit more would be good, and then we sure, can sure. open up some questions. It is, it is an almost 370 page book. So I've got more than, <laughs> I got plenty. All right. Um, yeah, so this is just another section. You know, I, I use a lot of, um, of visual metaphors to try and kind of explain the dynamic between my mother and I. Um, when I was in my twenties, I spent many years in a relationship with a neuroscientist. He performed brain surgery on zebra finches. These birds aren't born knowing their songs. They have to learn them. My ex would manipulate specific regions of their brains to see how it affected their ability to sing. After he lesioned parts of their minds, he placed them in isolation chambers and recorded them, studying how this incisive damage warped the structure of their songs. I've always thought of my mom as one of those birds. But in her mind, she had the backing chorus of Chinese culture to mask the discordant notes. In context, her damage was cradled within a larger hole and given a place in which to belong. I don't think she ever understood what her song sounded like in the isolation of America. Her urgent, anxious notes never assembled into a language I could speak. And the air between us grew thick with her anger and pain as she read my incomprehension as judgment, contempt, and disdain. So that's kind of one of the main themes in this book is I think through working on this, my mom and I have come to understand that even though we are both speaking English to one another, we are 
not in any way speaking the same cultural language. Um, and I, I think that's really been one of the most powerful parts of this experience is how through working on this book with my mom, we, we've really been able to see how much we need to constantly translate even things where we think we're on the same page um, because it turns out we never were. And that's, that's given us a lot of grace to move forward. So I think, I think probably I can do one more. Oh, that's pixelated. Darn. Okay. Well, I'm going to skip that because it's hard to see, but I'll, I'll do one more um, sequence and then we'll switch to a q and I asked my mom about the first signs of Sunny's mental illness. It started almost immediately after we got to Hong Kong. I remember one time she took me to a shop. I need to buy shoes for my daughter. At first she was acting pretty normal, but then when the man tried to help us, she started getting more and more agitated and paranoid. She started asking bizarre questions. Why are you asking the wrong questions? Who told you to say that? What are you hiding? Are these the right shoes? All I need to know is, are these the shoes that will protect her? I see them in this moment, a world comprised of exactly two people laying the groundwork for a definition of love that will pass through generations with the seed of damage in its bones, cementing the dynamic that will cause so much pain between my mother and me, in which a mother in her glowing broken devotion tries to save her daughter from an enemy that only she sees. And a daughter in turn wishes she could free her mother from the dark cage of her constant loving fear. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll stop on that really uplifting note and um, switch to a Q and A. <laughs> wow. Okay, I have the microphone and I'm going to try and unmute the fourth floor, although they might have to go. Oh, there they are. And I'm going to pass it around if anyone has any questions or comments. None here yet. Anybody on the fourth floor, Beatrice? No? Okay. I was wondering. Um, yeah, Eileen's got Oh, I don't think I have a question. I don't think I have a question so much as a comment that you told an incredibly profound story. Thank you. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, we could turn the tables, actually. I, I would be interested to have a question for you and the audience of, you know, so much of this process of working on a, an intergenerational story and, and really, you know, trying to, to know a grandmother who is inaccessible to me. I'm, I'm curious if any of you have, you know, grandchildren who are sort of the shepherds of your family stories and, and sort of how how you feel about the younger generation trying to, to pick up the thread of a family narrative. You don't have to answer. <laughs> I'm just curious. So I actually um, have a, it was a very exquisite work, very personal, and I appreciate you being so brave and sharing it uh, in your book and giving us a sneak preview. Um, it seems, I mean, I was looking at the rib cages, I was looking at the water that your mother's trying to throw you out of as she's drowning. I'm like, I'm thinking about like your artistic style. And I'm wondering, this is such a lame question, but I'm curious about your influences. It seems like there's a lot of expressionism there, but you know, I don't know a ton about art, so. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because it's a question that I get a lot. And I think because I am both a, a writer and a visual artist, I often find that my visual influences are actually literary and my literary influences are actually visual. So I think for this book, I've been um, much more motivated by, by other written works than I have by, um, yeah, by visual artists. But I will say, um, 
you know, Gustav Klimt, it's such an easy out because everyone loves his work, but he's definitely one of my favorite painters. And I think, you know, it's funny having to work in black and white where part of the reason I wanted to show some of my earlier paintings is to show that like in my heart of hearts, I'm a painter and I live for color. And so having to work solely in black and white, I think that's something that I've really had to teach myself in the course of this book is how to get, um, you know, textures and layering when I can't use color. And actually, since we're in my studio, I can show you, you know, I'm drawing this whole book in Japanese brush pen. So um, you can see this really tiny nib, I'll put my finger behind it for contrast. Um, these just have refillable ink barrels and, you know, there's no, there's no shading at all. Everything is just drawn with fine line with this. Um, and I think there's definitely been a, a really steep learning curve because um, I, I learned to draw comics for this project. And that's actually what I'm doing now, now that I'm near the end of it, is I'm redrawing a lot of the earliest pages just because it settled into its visual language so much that, um, that the earliest pages don't really fit anymore. And I drew the whole book out of order, which um, I think was mutually challenging for both myself and my editor, um, where I basically made all of the pieces as jigsaw puzzle pieces, and I'm only now putting them together. So that pages that um, sequentially, you know, like page four and page five, those might have been drawn three years apart. Um, so one of the things that I am going to have to do is go back digitally on my iPad and make sure that all the the faces of the characters are consistently rendered because I would say it did take me probably about nine months of full-time drawing to really settle into what my work looks like as a cartoonist because um because yeah I had to learn it for this so that kind of dodged your question um, but I tried <laughs> thank you any other questions from in here or up on the fourth floor Okay, I think you've given a complete presentation, so we'll just say thank you. Uh, enjoy your trip to Alaska. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.